Hey guys, I don't show my face very much on this channel, <clears throat> even though I used to, right? But um, somebody asked me recently, actually today, <laughs> recently today, somebody asked me today uh, about like an hour and a half ago, um, why the TF2 bot hosters host bots and why they bait so much and all of this and basically what's the reasoning and the, the purpose behind all of their stuff. And you know, me, I gave the obscenely long answer to all of it because I know that everything is connected, uh, whether people really like to care f uh, to enjoy it or not. Um, and so I'll probably have background footage of like some other game playing underneath this, but um, I just wanted to narrate my thoughts because I thought it would make for a decent short video before my big major video about this entire thing to the insanely absurd degree that I understand it to be. So, um, why the bot hosters host bots? There's not one definitive reason for every single one of them, and that is the fundamental truth that most YouTubers either are aware of and choose not to discuss, or are simply unaware of. This, there is yes, factors of the hosting itself that all tie back to the same symptoms or underlying causes, but there are a great many reasons as to why they specifically host bots. For some reason, uh, sorry, for some, it's an expression of technical skill. I put air quotes around this technical skill bit um, because there's real technical skill and the skill that one has that makes them simply feel good about themselves. Since gaming was born, practically, there were modified cartridges that were sold to consumers with cheat codes on them, like the Game Genie codes in uh, that you could apply to like most any NES game, but famously Tetris that they use in competitions uh, that enable you to read the scores of the game in hexadecimal so that like in the pro tournaments, right? you can calculate your score a lot easier once it goes past a million rather than just, uh, you know, calculating it manually. It makes your job much easier. In a way, that's the first example of cheats. Uh, although people back then referred to such tools as video game enhancers, right? The first examples of cheats were these Game Genie codes, but even back in the 80s, people were so resourceful and clever that they figured out what is now known as the infamous uh, Konami code, up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, B, A, and sometimes start or select. The This code, I believe, adds infinite lives in Contra. I believe that's when it was discovered. Um... Sorry, I lost my part in my little script here. Uh, the, these sort of things become prevalent with cheat codes like IDKFA and the original two Doom games in 1993 and 1994. Technically speaking, you can even cheat a, or in the original Half-Life games as long as the developer console is enabled, right? Naturally, there are trade and idle servers across most of Valve's games where the server hosts simply enable the all-powerful SV underscore cheats one command giving everyone free reign to cheat and do whatever they want. I mean, when I used it, I would like disable my HUD and basically go into photo mode and just kind of remove gravity and just zoom around the map and get these really rotoscopy shots. Uh, I thought it was really cool. Um, uh, giving everyone free reign to cheat and do whatever they please. One can even cheat in the single player campaigns of Half-Life 1 and Half-Life 2 by simply typing impulse 101 and acquiring all of the weapons that the game will eventually give you with sufficient ammo for the time being. Uh, I did that recently actually because I wanted to know is there like a version of IDKFA for Half-Life? And there is. <laughs> it's safe to say then that games as a whole have never discouraged cheating one way or the other. Most people having grown up watching sports on TV at that point in history understood the concept of rules in a game being necessary to give everyone a sporting chance, right? And to bend, break, or ignore those rules was unanimously seen as cheating. When video games come around in history, however, everyone knows that there's it's still experimental technology and uh, it, there's not a whole lot stopping you from breaking it or altering the code in any way, right? Especially if you're like smart enough to, to do so if you like have the knowledge for all of it, right? But for the most part, if you're playing like a multiplayer game, you know, like Mario Kart, there's obviously 
a trust system that really doesn't exist anymore uh, among modern games where like you really don't know who's trustworthy to play with anymore because everyone's a cheater because the skill the, the divides in the type of people who play games are enormous and this is kind of this isn't something i entirely wrote down but it's kind of like how the skill ceiling for games goes up really high and instead of people being encouraged by it they get turned off by it because of the laziness that this world has bred us to live in and it's really disappointing because tf2 used to be a prime example of how high a skill ceiling in a game could get and how possible it is to achieve it and you know that this is something i talk about in my big long video that i'm making the big twenty-five thousand word script um so stay tuned for that but to get back to the main point um, if you're playing by yourself, no one's really stopping you from just adding all those extra lives in when playing Contra, so who's going to care? This sentiment would stay free from online multiplayer games for a while, but soon it was made clear that, the th that through the anonymity of the internet, the infancy of trolling culture and memes, and the general dislike towards the internet from previous generations, that nobody would care if you cheated just a little bit in a video game. Right? Because, like, it's not that deep. It's just a game, bro. Right? But a little turns into a lot over time through the classic snowball effect. It's the story as old as time itself. When you tell a three-year-old not to do something or not to go somewhere, chances are they're going to do it anyways. Right? And I'm from a large family, so I know this, like, to an experience that most others really don't. <laughs> this behavior is mainly... This behavior in man is due largely in part to the original sin, where God told Adam and Eve that they could eat from any tree except for one, yet they were tempted to eat the one fruit that they were told not to eat anyways. That temptation has remained pre-programmed in humanity's mind since the beginning of time, and the Catholic Church defines that as original sin. And that curiosity, I mean, if you want to reframe it for the modern audience, I suppose it can be described as curiosity. Right. Just genuine biological curiosity. Uh, it, it's part of our evolutionary biology at this point. Right. And it's proven useful in certain situations. Children are much smarter than people let on. And often their intelligence is squashed or wasted by neglectful parents that send them away to schools and daycares. Environments designed to rein in and restrain the natural curiosity of how things work. That's why you have all those memes about how like why does school not teach me how to do taxes, right? Because school isn't an environment for you to learn how to be a better person or at least a more practical person. School is meant to breed factory workers, okay? That's really all it is. Most school buildings are reformatted prisons, right? It's all about this very tight formula that you have to fit in, and there, there's absolutely no room for creativity, curiosity, or growth at all. That's why creative people, for the most part, are often seen as deviants in society because they're very all over the place in this rebellious aspect because they don't know how to frame it other than rebelliously, I suppose. <laughs> uh, anyways, back to the point. Uh, you don't, obviously, you don't want your little brother to drink the Windex bottle you accidentally left within his reach, right? But what does, what does he know at the age of two or three, right? All he knows is that things react to his cause if he is capable of causing them to react, Right? Um, press a button on the TV remote and it changes something as long as you're pointing it in the right direction, which they pick up on really, really fast. Uh, drive a toy car and the wheels move. Grab a bottle of liquid and it moves around inside the container. And obviously because the only liquid he's ever drank at that point is like uh, breast milk, formula, or water at that point, he has no idea what bad liquid actually tastes like because nothing's ever been given to him. All liquid has been good. So he doesn't expect it to react any differently than other liquid other than that it will taste different than those two or three liquids, right? Um, but he doesn't know that the bad taste is going to kill him, right? Uh, the curiosity of man is always geared towards the reactivity of objects around them. You don't see children banging their heads against a wall uh, or banging their hands on a wall, right? Past the age of two-ish when they learn how to walk. Because, like, they'll bang their hands on a wall when they're crawling around on the floor, right? But once they learn that the wall won't react to them, they know better than to bang on the wall. Because they subconsciously note that the wall doesn't react, and so they move away from the wall, 
because the wall doesn't do anything outside of them, right? And it doesn't do anything because of them. So it's not important to their brains. And that's how human brains are supposed to work. This is, that's, that's called compartmentalization. I know all of this because I'm the oldest of 13 children with the 14th on the way. I have experienced these mannerisms of curiosity my entire life, and the proper cultivation of those curiosities is what brings up children of a highly intelligent caliber. But what happens, you might ask, when the curiosity isn't properly cultivated, right? What happens if, in the board game of Monopoly, and I've had this experience before with other families, I just switch the dice around when the other player isn't looking, landing me on a property instead of going to jail? right? Will they notice? Will they react? Most of the time they will react. They will notice. And that reaction will be negative because it's not fair. Then the other child will complain to mom or dad saying that the dice was switched. Excuse me. Oh goodness. Whoa. <clears throat> Sorry. When the first child confesses to this unaware that it was the wrong thing to do, it is then when the idea of cheating is formed in the child's mind as something not to do at the very least with or around other people due to the negative reaction that the child, uh, j j uh, because of the negative reaction that it produces. Like I remember as a kid, I would play Monopoly by myself and I would simulate the dice being in certain areas for the theoretical best game. Um, and technically that's no different than going into single player mode in a video game and just like, cheating and just breaking the game, hacking it, going completely against the design of the game and just, um, just messing it up to see how optimally it can be produced. I mean, that's what speedrunners do to continue optimizing strategies, right? Some speedrunners just break the code of the game to figure it out. And it's that curiosity that is impressive to see in single player games, right? Where it doesn't affect anybody, but in multiplayer games, it's different because, when you play a multiplayer game, obviously there are rules. And this is why I brought up the historical context of people who've watched sports for, for all of their lives until the point in history where video games began to exist. Because sports have rules. You respect the rules because it gives everyone a shot, even the not-so-good players. That's why you have upsets. That's why you have comebacks. That's why you have chokes. Or that's why you have absolute blowouts. And it gives everyone a chance to win. Um, uh, buh, 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 buh. But, if the, but if the parent simply shrugged it off or didn't care about the initial instance and the instances that follow throughout life, the child will simply see the reaction from others as unnecessary. And specifically in this day and age, now more than ever, reactions that are deemed unnecessary from other people are utilized as a power tool for the other party. Quite narcissistically if something angers upsets or depresses someone on the internet chances are that if sympathy isn't the first thing you receive it will be something from it will be someone who's so antagonistic bullying mean or crude that it's a wonder to you as to how that person even makes it through life right this is what we call nowadays is the trolling community where they do it for the lulls right and this goes beyond like standard ball breaking that men specifically will typically partake in as a means of humor as a means of bonding with one another to see if you can actually take ribbing, like take a joke. Um, that's how men typically socialize. This trolling goes beyond jabbing. It's bullying times a thousand. Bot hosters, to bring this back to TF2, bot hosters by and large do it for the lulls to various degrees. A select few still maintain the partial childlike innocence, and I say partial because there's no way that their consciences aren't informed by the negative reactions of other people. Uh, there's, they still maintain the partial childlike innocence of the curiosity and different results that cheating can bring them, never even being able to mentally understand how or why that isn't the way things are supposed to work. Regardless of whether or not the real world operates like that, cheating is something that is not supposed to happen. Um, politicians cheat using whatever methods they can to uh, obtain popularity and power, and the bot hosters cheat using whatever methods they can to obtain their own notoriety. A con another concept of the internet is that you will become more popular for providing a net negative than a net positive, as negativity is what draws more responses. 
because of another aspect of the internet where everyone's opinion means everything and nothing at the same time. And people have no chill because of the anonymity of the internet. They don't need to have chill. So negativity is responded to much more because you have the luxury of reacting more viscerally than you would in real life. Because if something like that happened in real life, like physically in a room with everyone there, things would not operate like that at all because people would actually have control over themselves because of social cues and just general human decency. The internet removes the necessity for human decency. And that's honestly quite a sad thing. Um, do, 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 where is it? Uh, blah, 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 blah. uh, yeah, negative negativity is what draws more responses. That childlike mannerism, unbridled, untaught, and carefree, uh, rears its head again in a body, soul, and mind that is frankly too old to contain that spirit anymore. And the spirit of this, the, 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 the seeking of reactivity, like they love the reactivity and they, they, because they haven't actually grown up. Right. Because that's what you hear a lot in like older TV shows, like what I grew up with. It's like you got to you got to just grow up. Right. Growing up means not treating everything as an experiment. That's what sociopaths do. And that's something that is a temptation of children and basically everybody. But I'll get to that in a moment. Um, it's it's it creates this difficulty to even have friends as a kid. And so you want obviously to maintain curiosity but only in the fields in which the curiosity can be utilized in a net positive not a net negative um otherwise you categorically become crazy um thus that spirit becomes what religions would call a carnal desire the desire for attention reactivity and the results that come from it is something that every human possesses to differing degrees for most well-raised people that desire is tamed so easily that people don't even realize it in a social environment and this is again another problem with the internet the internet as a whole like the people within it nowadays bring awareness to these desires and uh defines them as intrusive thoughts. We've all seen memes about intrusive thoughts, right? Intrusive thoughts are frankly a very boring topic to speak about in a well-versed environment as a conversation about it would go something like, I should jump in the pool. No, that's stupid. You're right. Like if you actually voiced all of the intrusive thoughts that you had in, in real life and like gave them as much credence as you did on the internet or other people gave credence to you on the internet, like, Humanity would have been extinct ages ago, <laughs> okay? Um, due to the negativity that the lulls people thrive within nowadays, however, intrusive thoughts are given so much credence to the point where someone's entire being, personality, and identity can be centered around something so minimal, superficial, or flat-out false in every aspect. It was never meant to be given credence in the first place, but the internet weakens the mind to bring a little too much awareness to that initial thought. And then it snowballs, right? It snowballs into, oh, I am centering myself and my identity around this one superficial thing that has very little philosophical meaning in the first place because uh, somebody on the internet gave me enough credence or a group of people on the internet gave me enough credence or God forbid, human beings who, who who I've encountered physically who live on the internet all, all the time, uh, all the time, gave me too much credence, right? There is a term for people like these, people who thrive in the lulls culture, breeding various degrees of negativity, from the smallest jab of jokes to the largest culmination of a desire to see the other person end their own life. Like, You've seen all those memes uh, and all those jabs on the internet through Discord channels of, like, kill yourself. Like, when a conversation gets to that point. It, there's a, a word for the, these types of people who enjoy this, and these are called sadists. Sadism is the delight one takes in the suffering he or she inflicts upon another, to whatever degree that suffering may be. As a child, it's bullying. As a teenager and adult, however, it becomes something far worse if it is not reined in. That something, of course, becomes sociopathy. 
such a lack or care of interest in what other people think or believe in that they see their actions as entirely inconsequential. They do not believe that the reactions of people towards their actions matter anymore, and they lose sight of that reactivity. The only thing they care about is uh, about... Sorry. The... The only thing they care about the reactivity of anymore, naturally, is negative emotions on an extreme level, typically of anger or sadness. Go down that rabbit hole even further and you reach the final stage of philosophical mental destruction, Machiavellianism. Machiavelli was a philosopher in the time of the 1500s, right? And he wrote many works about his evolved form of sociopathy. Machiavellianism is what most people incorrectly generalize as simply psychopathy. But true psychopathy is not even in the same league as Machiavellianism, okay? Machiavellianism is characterized by manipulation of people to the highest degree to suit their own personal gain. Like, such a great imitation of being a friend only to get thrown under the bus at the end, right? A complete and conscious rejection of any moral compass whatsoever, indifference to the suffering of others, so not even the lack of care anymore. It is formal indifference, not informal indifference. Formal indifference would be like, oh, I just don't care, but that is a reaction to the reactivity and you're concealing the reaction that you receive because you know that concealing the reaction and subtextually informing the person through your tone or manner of speech that you do not care but actually do care about what they're saying and getting a rise out of it that is different from formal indifference where you actually don't care about the sufferings of others anymore like it does nothing to you you have no reaction anymore and a meticulous and carefully calculated focus on the carnal benefits of self. All right. The bot hosters all share these aspects, but the most notorious ones these days possess the indifference to the sufferings of others now more than ever. The truth about negative energy is that unlike positive energy, it can never stop. It's like any other addiction. You just want to go further and further or farther and farther to replicate the same feeling as the first high. But the indifference of Machiavellianism proves that at the end stages, that high can never be re replicated. And you'll eventually kill yourself trying to, to replicate that high, right? Um, they will seek more and more hate. And while some may stop and be content with the reactions and hate that they receive, and I say some because it's really not that frequent, um, it's not that common for people to stop, a very small number of them will simply go farther just because they can the reactions no longer mean anything it's now about the goal of going as far as possible before it all blows up in your face right because who cares at that point at least you'd have made it farther than anyone else dared to and for all of that you will be remembered as the most hated person ever and you will be the most remembered because of it you will live in infamy forever in a way you will have succeeded in becoming the most universally hated man in that community to the point where not even the YouTubers can resist speaking your name. And I have that problem with YouTubers a lot, just as a side tangent, because they talk about like, oh, don't say the name of the bot hosters. Don't don't give them any more attention than they want. It's basically Lord Voldemorting the whole thing. It's like y y you treat everybody as this he who must not be named character. And that's actually what they want, because not not having the guts to say their name is the perfect um, example, or I guess, uh, how would you put it? I guess it's the perfect uh, demonstration of how much power and control they actually have over the community. Like, and of course there's a lot of them, so of course you can't mention all of them, but like, Omegatronic, Deltatronic, Hexatronic, Mechinator, you know, the platypus bots, the the ones that Rosny uh, actually himself hosts. It's like you, you are afraid of saying their names or you don't want to because you don't want to give them attention. But by saying, I'm not going to say your, their name, it is, it is cultivating that three-year-old desire of, of, you told me not to do this thing, so I'm going to do it anyway. It, it, it fosters the curiosity in people that watch your stuff to actually go out and find out who these people actually are. 
That's why you have people asking bot hosters questions all the time and like interviewing them, right? It's, it's, it, you think you're telling people the right thing to do and you're not because there really isn't a right thing to do at that point. You're just, you're just feeding into their fear mongering. So lesson to all of YouTubers, all of you YouTubers out there from small little me, just stop pretending that they have this much power over you. I know that they probably do in the game, but you can behave better than that, right? So to wrap it all up, the bot hosters host bots because they have developed symptoms, behaviors, and characteristics of sadism, narcissism, sociopathy, and Machiavellianism. Yes, they are trolls, and it is the watering down of that word that brings so much confusion to the table. They're just trolls is not a good answer anymore. It's like the watering down of the word depressed, right? If you get enough attention, everyone can be depressed. And most people on the internet pretend to be depressed for the attention. And then they get so hooked on the attention, oh, sorry, they get so hooked on the attention, right, that they actually develop a form of depression that is even more difficult to retreat from and fix because they know that it's entirely self-constructed and they refuse to admit it because the act gets them attention. And so they will maintain the act for the attention and the reaction that an actual therapist would try to dismantle, right? Um, the ridiculous stuff such as the N-word counter and a chat that operates as a radio receiver in-game, like how it takes like the, the chat logs from the bots in-game and the reactions of the people to the bots in-game, uh, that acts as a radio receiver in-game, um, is raw energy. It's the cherry on top and the icing and sprinkles on the cake. It's the superficial barriers people like to put up for themselves um, to represent who they are. And sadly, this barrier, unlike other barriers across the internet, of course, actually represents their kind better and more philosophically correctly than most. Uh, yes, they're baiting because it's all they know how to do. The only thing they do at that point, the only thing we can do towards the bait at that point is be strong enough to pull the rod into the water so that they can't fish anymore. But of course, they'll simply get another fishing rod, more hooks and more bait, and it won't stop until the lake can be closed, the, uh, closed off from fishing or something else can be done about it, right? You can tell people to fish elsewhere. So that's basically my thoughts on the entire thing. It's very, very, very summarized. It's a summarized version of my... Um, um, actual large essay um, because I, I just whipped this up in about 45 minutes to an hour and I the the mega script itself is around 25,000 words now and this one is only about 2200 so this is a summary it's about a tenth of the points I'm going to make but this is basically the explanation of why people do what they do. And holy cow, that actually took a long time. 28 minutes. Gosh dang. All right. Well, that's all for me. I will see you guys later and um, enjoy yourselves. Have a good day, night, whatever, and be happy. All right. Talk to you later.